So again, these uh, lectures are all recorded online uh, on my YouTube channel if you missed it or you want to go back over it. Um, we left off last time in book two, and we, uh, I wanted to conclude that before moving on to book three, which is our subject matter today. But in book two, we had not yet finished the description of two figures. Now, there are two figures that were at the portal of hell. Just to refresh your memories, uh, Milton had <coughs> invoked his muse, spoke of what the whole scope of his epic subject matter would be, and then proceeded to describe uh, Satan uh, on the floor of the or rather they're on the, the fiery lake uh, where he had fallen after a war in heaven, which we're not going to read, but which is told in books five and six. And so it begins there in the middle of things with him there, and then he rises up and then pronounces that he is going to seek vengeance for his first defeat. And he's going to do so by perverting mankind. And now he's flying up or trying to fly but he doesn't have control of himself even, flying up towards this place called Earth that he has never yet seen and or paradise within it and to see if he can pervert mankind, which he's also never laid eyes on. But he's heard when he was in heaven that, ma that God planned on uh, creating this race that would bear his image, etc., etc. So he's now gone up to the portal of hell and he encounters these two creatures. And we've not, I didn't actually explain who they were. I was just reading the passage, so I'm going to continue to do that here, and uh, then I will comment. So I described the first, who, one who seemed a woman to the waist, but ended foul like a serpent, and the second, and I'm trying to find the page here, if shape, it might be called that shape had none, line 666, number of the beast, right? Uh, distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance might be called it shadow seamed. So it's a very uh, ominous description. It's describing a being that is indes indescribable. Again, a shadow that has substance, but su shadow, so you, you throw a shadow from a substance. If you stand against the sunlight, you'll see your shadow. That's because you have substance, and it, it breaks the light. But here it's in hell where there's no light. So he's describing the indescribable, and it adds to the horror of the depiction. And if you want to see an analogy, the best I can come up with, if you uh, are aware of it, is in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings when the Balrog appears. I think it has a similar, he's using similar sorts of language. It's not good in the movie because you see the Balrog, and it's, it's scarier when before you see it, when you finally do see it, OK. It's scary enough. He's got a whip and he looks demonic and he's huge and okay, but it's not as scary as before you see him. As soon as you see him, uh, a little less so, but that's what this is. And he's coming and he cross, he goes right in front of Satan as Satan intends to go through the gates and says, you're not going there, more or less, effectively saying that. And Satan responds to him, I'm going through that door. You better get out of my way, more or less. And then the creature responds, because he says he's from heaven. You know, I'm a heavenly born creature. How dare you? I've never seen anything uglier than you. How dare you? And at that point, a battle was about to commence because both of them are, neither of them is giving way. So matched they stood, for never but once more was either like to meet so great a foe. That's line 720. And now great deeds had been achieved whereof all hell had rung, had not the snaky sorceress that sat fast by hell gate and kept the fatal key risen and with hideous outcry rushed between. O oh, father, what intends thy hand, she cried, against thy only son? What fury, O oh, son, possesses thee to bend that mortal dart against thy father's head? And knowst for whom? For him who sits above and laughs, the while at thee ordained his drudge to execute whate'er his wrath, which he calls justice, bids his wrath, which one day will destroy ye both. 
she spake, and at her words the hellish pest forbore. Then these to her Satan returned. So strange thy outcry, and thy words so strange, thou interposest that my sudden hand prevented spares to tell thee yet by deeds what it intends, till first I know of thee what thing thou art, thus double formed, and why in this infernal veil first met thou callest me father, and that phantasm callest my son. I know thee not, nor ever saw till now sight more detestable than him and thee. To whom thus the portress of Hellgate replied, Hast thou forgot me then, and do I seem now in thine eyes so foul, once deemed so fair in heaven, when at the assembly and in sight of all the seraphim with thee, combined in bold conspiracy against heaven's king? All on a sudden miserable pain surprise thee, dim thine eyes, and dizzy swam in darkness, while thy head flames thick and fast threw forth on the left side, opening wide, likest to thee in shape, and countenance bright in his own image. Then shining heavenly fair, a goddess armed out of thy head I sprung. Amazement seized all the host of heaven. Back they recoiled afraid at first and called me sin, and for a sign portentous held me. But familiar grown I pleased, and with attractive graces won the most averse, thee chiefly, who full oft thyself in me thy perfect image viewing became enamored, and such joy thou tookst with me in secret that my womb conceived a growing burden. Meanwhile war arose and fields were fought in heaven, wherein remain for what, el what could else to our almighty foe clear victory, to our part loss and rout through all the imperium. Down they fell, driven headlong from the pitch of heaven, down into this deep, and in the general fall I also. At which time this powerful key into my hand was given, with charge to keep these gates forever shut, which none can pass without my opening. Pensive here I sat alone, but long I sat not, till my womb, pregnant by thee, and now excessive grown, prodigious motion felt and rueful throes. At last this odious offspring, whom thou seest, thine own begotten, breaking forth, breaking violent way, tore through my entrails, that with fear and pain distorted all my nether shape thus grew transformed into the serpent. But he, my inbred enemy, forth issuing, brandishing his fatal dart made to destroy. I fled and cried out, Death! Hell trembled at the hideous name and sighed from all her caves and back resounded, Death! I fled, but he pursued, though more it seems inflamed with lust than rage and swifter far me overtook, his mother, all dismayed, and in embraces forcible and foul, engendering with me of that rape, begot these yelling monsters that with ceaseless cries surround me as thou sawest, hourly conceived and hourly born with sorrow infinite to me. For when they list, that is when they hear something, into the womb that bred them they return and howl and gnaw my bowels, their repast, their food. Then bursting forth afresh with conscious terrors, vex me round that rest or intermission none I find. Before mine eyes, in opposition sits grim death, my son and foe, who sets them on, and me his parent would full soon devour for want of other prey, but that he knows his end with mine involved, and knows that I should prove a bitter morsel and his bane whene'er, whenever that shall be. So fate pronounced. But thou, O oh Father, I forewarn thee, shun his deadly arrow. Neither vainly hope to be invulnerable in those bright arms, though tempered heavenly, for that mortal dint, save he who reigns above, none can resist. So I'm going to interrupt and I'll come back to this in a second. We have three figures here. We have Satan, we have sin, and we have death. An infernal trinity of sorts. Uh, in uh, 
James chapter 1, I believe it's 117. It says when, uh, uh, well, I'll give you an exact quote here. Milton's taken the description from, from scripture here. No, it's not 117. Six, 15. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So James 1.15, he's, he's imagining this. Now, um, James, the apostle writing this, or the Lord's brother, <coughs> depending on who you see the author is, but normally seen as the Lord's brother, um, is speaking about how sin works in a person. Milton is taking it as a, an event as if these were agents, as grand actors, as if death were a, were a person, and likewise sin. So imaginatively, imaginatively representing them as, um, as great enemies. And in some ways uh, appealing to the personification that we even, uh, even Paul uses, the last enemy is death. So an enemy is a person, right? Not a thing, not a, uh, an abstraction. So the sense of a, a hostility connected to something personal. I mean, in, in uh, Western literature, we saw this last semester when I looked at um, every man, death was personified and presented as you know, the grim reaper calling and calls you and he comes to you and so forth. That's how Milton is conceiving it here. And he, he I mean, it's obviously an imaginative rendering, but still he's basing it on something scriptural. And, and the portrait here is uh, how, where did sin even come from? And Milton's suggestion is that it came from uh, Satan's own head and it came from his sinful thoughts when he was in heaven looking on God and, and specifically on the, on the coronation of the sun. And he envied and he thought it ought to be him, not the son of God who received these honors. At that point, he and he felt this was an injustice. And at that point, the thought sprung from his head and it was in his own image. And he liked that image. Now, the Milton is obviously coming up with this and it's nowhere depicted in scripture as such. Uh, but he's drawing on classical sources here. So Athena, the goddess of wisdom, sprung from Zeus's head. That's where he's getting part of this image from. So it's sprung from the side of Zeus's head. And it says, whereas Athena is the, the goddess of wisdom, represents the divine wisdom of, of uh, Zeus there. But the other analogy that he's using is the creation of Eve from Adam's side. And remember the two together, as Genesis 1:26, 27 describes it, the two together are made in, in the image of God. And that actually, the account of Eve coming out of Adam's side, out of his rib, is in Genesis 2, 14, I think. I'm not sure about the verse exactly. But in Genesis 2, Adam's on his own. And God says, not good for man to be alone. All right? And then describes him being taken, her being taken out of his side. So both of those depictions are here. And the sense that the two, Adam and Eve, bear the imago Dei. They bear the image of God. Here, Milton is, again, uh, in a sort of an analogy suggesting that that is where sin and death come from. They are in the image of Satan. And Satan, of course, is not interested in others. He's interested in only himself. And he loves himself. He doesn't love God. He ought to love God. He's, 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 uh, Martin Luther in his commentary on uh, the book of Romans describes uh, sin as being curved in on ourselves. In se corvatus is his uh, phrase. Oh dear, I almost did it. I didn't pull it down, that's good. In uh, English, some say, say navel gazing. But here it's narcissism. That's another picture as well. Uh, the, the, uh, in all of its metamorphosis, it tells the story of uh, Echo and Narcissus. Narcissus is a beautiful young man. The nymphs all love him. They are all wishing they were with this young man. He's so beautiful. And he thinks he's so beautiful as well. And he can't find a nymph that's suitable to him. And then one day he looks down into a pool of water and he sees the most beautiful thing he ever saw, which is himself. And he looks down and then he falls into the water and drowns. 
and then there's an echo that arises out of that anyway. Um, but that image here uh, of the futility of self-love as opposed to loving the one who deserves to be loved, all of those Milton is, is drawing upon for this portrait here, and it, I think it's, it's splendid. And it also reflects the perversity though. So there's the analogy, the parallel between the two accounts, and yet there's also the perversity of this account because of course, not only does uh, Satan make love to himself, he does it secretly, as if it were, and this is in heaven, where nothing's secret, I mean, nothing's secret from God anyway, and nothing's secret in heaven, but he does it, the emphasis is in secret, there's something illicit here, and furthermore, when the, her womb uh, is, conceives this growing burden, it then does, she doesn't give birth, it tears through her entrails, like it rips, and then that creates the serpentine, so this, this creature results, which is now called sin. And then worse than that, the progeny, which is this grim figure called death, is interested in her as well. And then he rapes her. So it's incest and rape. It's gruesome stuff. It's, again, contrasted with the wonderful use of love and creation and procreation in uh, God's design. And that it's intentional. So he's intentionally drawing a very wicked and horrid portrait here. But these three are bound up together. And note that sin w in the passage w that I just concluded with says that um, he ne Satan needs to avoid the dart of death because none can withstand the dart of death save one. And he's the one who will destroy you both. And of course, that's Christ. But she, so she's, al she's already given the game away before anything's happened, of course. One day she knows that the Son of God will destroy both of them, but for now, sin and, sin and death and, and Satan are actors on the stage and have roles to play. But watch out. And for his part, death won't destroy sin because to destroy sin would be to destroy unrighteousness and then death would go with it. So he can't eat her as much as he wants to because he wants to, because death is hungry and there's nothing there to eat except mum. But if he eats mum, he eats the very basis, I mean, death comes after sin, right? So if you eat sin, there's no more death. He disappears in that. One day, Christ will not only conquer death, but he will also conquer sin, and the two go together, right? So it's all interesting uh, theological uh, and imaginative reflections on, you know, basic themes. But he, so now she's trying to reconcile the father and the son and think, well, what sort of son is this? He's a, what a horrible, hideous monster he is. And he has a crown, the likeness of a crown on his, whatever the likeness of his head is. And all of this is made in the image of Satan, of course. So this is a, these reflections and the horror of Satan who only regards himself. He's ho actually, is, he ought to be horrified at who he is now. What he imagines himself to be is as this heavenly being. What he's become is this uh, unrecognizable creature who's not even in control of, his, um, uh, of what happens in hell because the king of hell is death. Mum has the key to get out, but death ru rules here, even over Satan. Anyway, I'll come back up, but it, isn't that, I think, I think it's just brilliant and horrifying. I mean, what, one of the more horrid pictures in all of literature. <coughs> this idea of a, of a rape and an incest and a violence and all so forth. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. These three figures, Satan, sin, and death. Um, anything possible with these things? You'll bring those up on the first test. Well, I don't have a test. Okay. Like the first essay, I would have thought so. There, there's an opportunity at any rate because we're going to come shortly to book three and then we're going to go from looking at what happens in hell Milton shifts his gaze to, well, what's going on in heaven? While all this is going on, what's God doing? Because up to this point, he's only announced that he will assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to man. But we have not heard anything of that. We've seen nothing of that. And that will be the shift. So this action happening, what's God doing? So he'll shift scenes. And then we'll get a dialogue between God the Father and God the Son. And uh, anyway, um, but, but, but you may well have something there for you to work with. I should have thought so. At any rate, she finished, it said, and then, and the subtle fiend, that is Satan, 
his lore soon learned, now milder, and thus answered smooth. Dear daughter, since thou claimst me for thy sire, of course it's his daughter and it's also the one he has committed, I don't even know if you call it adultery because it's self-love, I mean what is that act? Right, she's the progeny of his self-love. It's his daughter, that's it. Anyway, so they're using titles that don't really fit exactly even because all the moral categories are gone, all the personal categories. That's the monstrosity of this. But at any rate, since thou claims me for thy sire and my fair son here shows me the dear pledge of dalliance had with thee in heaven and joys then sweet, now sad to mention through dire change befallen us unseen, unthought of. No, I come no enemy, but to set free from out this dark and dismal house of pain both him and thee and all the heavenly host of spirits that in our just pretenses armed fell with us from on high. From them I go this uncouth errand soul and one for all myself expose with lonely steps to tread the unfounded deep and through the void immense to search with wandering quest a place foretold should be and by concurring signs ere now created vast and round a place of bliss in the purlieus of heaven and therein placed a race of upstart creatures to supply perhaps our vacant room though more removed lest heaven surcharged with potent multitude might hap to move new broils be this or aught than this more secret now designed I haste to know and this once known shall soon return and bring ye to the place where thou and death shall dwell at ease and up and down unseen wing silently the buxom air embalmed with odors there ye shall be fed and filled immeasurably all things shall be your prey he ceased for both seemed highly pleased and death grinned horrible a ghastly smile to hear his famine should be filled and blessed his maw to destined to that good hour no less rejoiced his mother bad and thus bespake her sire the key of this infernal fit pit by due and by command of heavens all powerful kin king I keep by him forbidden to unlock these adamantine gates against all force death stands ready to interpose his dart fearless to be overmatched by living might but what oh I to his commands above who hates me and hath hither thrust me down into this gloom of Tartarus profound to sit in hateful office here confined inhabitant of heaven and heavenly born here in perpetual agony and pain with terrors and with clamors compassed round of mine own brood that on my bowels feed <coughs> thou art my father thou my author thou my being gavest me whom should I obey but thee whom follow thou wilt bring me soon to that new world of light and bliss among the gods who live at ease and where I shall reign at thy right hand, voluptuous, as beseems thy daughter and thy darling without end. So she'll sit at the Father's right hand, just like Christ is at his Father's right hand. Sin will be at Satan's right hand. <coughs> Takes the key out and gives it to him. Go ahead. So Satan promises to not only to go out himself, but to create a place where sin and death can live as well, out of hell. They're very happy at this. Then he goes out and he paves a highway. A highway to hell. Not just an ACDC track. Right? It's that, and that's, and it's, a, it's a broad way. Anyone can get down there. So he does a very good road. This is a, a terrific road. Broad and wide and easy to get there. Anyone who's up on earth can get down there. Uh, so out, out he goes. And so we have, there's their plan. And of course, uh, sin and death do rule over this world. We can see their reign in the fact that people sin and people die. And then there's the ruler of the air, Satan himself. But more or less, that, that's it. And they, 
uh, go up and then they go up to book three. Any comments or questions? I want to move on to book three, but I thought that was worth tearing on just for a little bit in, in part because I just think it's, uh, it's splendid. Now, in many editions of Paradise Lost that are in anthologies, they just cut that out, which I just simply don't understand. I don't because it's one of the more memorable passages in all of literature. And, and important in terms of uh, the, uh, not only the theology of Paradise Lost, but even in terms of the actions of Paradise Lost, that event. So the three of them are now going to go and try and pervert mankind. It's not just Satan. It will be sin and death that are loosed from hell. Questions, though? This, and if not, I will proceed on. Okay. So book three, as I say, moves to the, the gaze of the poet moves to describe heaven. And I, I said to you in the epic conventions that it is very common for uh, there to be a council of the gods. So in, in both the Iliad and the Odyssey and in uh, Virgil's Aeneid, uh, the Athena will be counseling with, with Juno or Zeus and so forth. There'll be a discussion going on about what's going on with the hero and why the th hero is being thwarted or some sort, of, some sort of discussion of that nature. And so Milton is doing something like that here, but he waits till book three. So he finishes what's going on down in hell and now he shifts up to heaven. So he's following the convention and in some ways he's breaking it though as well because he's not put it immediately there. Right at the outset, he's delayed two books. But now he comes to it and the argument is that God sitting on his throne, sees Satan flying towards this world. Now here's Milton's problem. He's describing a God who is not only all-seeing, but is outside of space and time. He's not bound by the creaturely, finite conditions of life that we live under. So when Milton describes this, he's of necessity um, anthropomorphizing. He's making God into an agent of space and time. So God sees this happening while Satan's doing this. Well, of course he does. He sees everything happening, past, present, and future. And he's not bound by that. But Milton presents him to some, I mean, he'll explain that that is the case, but still he describes him to some degree as an agent observing what is about to happen. A and he sees him flying towards the world then newly created, shows him to the son who sat at his right hand foretells the success of Satan in perverting mankind, clears his own justice and wisdom from all imputation, having created man free and able to enough to have withstood his tempter, yet declares his purpose of grace towards him in regard he fell not of his own malice, as did Satan, but by Satan seduced. Okay, so all those things happen right at the outset. I'm, I'm, we're going to get to that. But everything... Look at what Satan's doing. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to succeed, and then I'm going to forgive Adam. It's, it's all there. So the whole thing is given away. Like if you want, in, in terms of the plot giveaway, it's all, everything's there right from the beginning, which in most renderings ought to rob it of all interest because people get very upset when you give away, you know, what's going to happen in the next episode of whatever thing you're watching or reading, if some, oh, let me tell you how that ends. Don't tell me. May as well not read it then. Well, in this case, they know what's going to happen. So again, I say the way of understanding literature historically is not in terms of hearing a story you've never heard. It's in hearing a story that you know and hearing it well told. That's Milton's aim. So in book three here, uh, having said that, I mentioned that in book one, there's an invocation of the muse. Milton does it again here. And the reason why is because he just described hell. And as a, as a man who himself is subject to sin and, descri and, and describing such evil matter as we just depicted, uh, he's now going to describe heaven, which is far harder still and far more dangerous. I think in the medieval age, they thought that if a person looked on the devil, just merely looked on him, you'd go mad. 
but it's impossible to look upon God and live, right? You can't, because a sinful being cannot look upon a holy God. It's depicted throughout scripture furthermore. So what Milton's about to describe, uh, previous authors refused to entertain this description. So even back in Dante, in the Paradiso, he doesn't describe God. There's a trinity there, but he's, it's very vague. And it's, uh, it's clear from the description that's not described. And, and it doesn't speak. God doesn't speak in the Paradiso. You hear the angels praising God and so forth. But there's no speech from... And Milton, on the other hand, gives God speech. And so this is where there have been many critiques of Milton's Paradise Lost uh, from various angles, but the one that seems to me the most uh, valid is the fact that he, he dares to describe God and give him language. Now, when he does so, he tries to make him as orthodox as he can, and, uh, and some complain that's exactly the point. He sounds like a theologian. So Satan speaks in great rhetorical speeches of grandeur, and uh, even if we think he's the bad guy, we still think there's something heroic about Satan, whereas God sounds like a boring theologian. And so God's not nearly grand enough, so he fails in his portrait. And I think, he, I think that critique is correct myself. And that's not because Milton's not a good poet, it's because it's an impossible task. Uh, what he is trying to describe is hid from our eyes, and yet he is going to try and do so. Now, he's aware of the immensity of the task, which is why he invokes the muse. So let me begin with the invocation. And the invocation goes on for 55 lines. So this one's even longer. It's twice as long as the other one. And I'm going to read it all, and then I, I'm going to make some comments. But in this invocation, there are self-referential, uh, and I'll say this at the outset before I read it, there are references to himself, and one of the things he refers to is the fact that he's blind. Milton is blind when he writes this. He grew up with, it wasn't that he was born blind, he grew up with sight, but he lost his sight. By the time he comes uh, to write this, he's not writing it, he's dictating it. He's got three daughters, and he dictates the verse that comes to his mind in dreams, he says, he dictates to his daughter, his daughter writes it down. So he never gets to see it. And there, so he's the blind poet. And in that, there's a long legacy of prophets, poets who are born blind. One of them we saw last semester. Um, can you remember his name? Those of you who are with me. What was his name? The, yes? Tiresias. Yes. He was a prophet and blind struck blind by the gods, in fact. But you could also think of the Apostle Paul on the Emmaus Ro or, or on the uh, Damascus Road, struck blind, at least for three days. And the visions that, he, that compensated for that. So there's a, and there's a long tradition of, um, and, and it was said, actually, that Homer himself might be blind. So the first epic written by Homer, Homer himself is often historically presented as a blind bard. So Milton sees encouragement in the fact that he's lost the one thing which you would think you would need to be a writer. So all that lays there in the background, as well as the fact that he's just come up from describing hell and he's now about to describe heaven, but he can't see. So let me read the invocation first of all, which fittingly is, Hail, holy light. Offspring of heaven, firstborn, or of the eternal co-eternal beam, may I express thee unblamed, since God is light, and never but in unap unapproached light dwelt from eternity, dwelt then in thee, bright affluence of bright essence in create. Or hearst thou rather pure ethereal stream, whose fountain, who shall tell, before the sun, before the heavens thou wert, and at the voice of God, as with a mantle didst invest the rising world of waters, dark and deep, one from the void and formless infinite. Thee I revisit now, 
with bolder wing escaped the Stygian pool, though long detained in that obscure sojourn, while in my flight, through utter and through middle darkness, born with other notes than to the Orphean lyre, I sung of chaos and eternal night, taught by the heavenly muse to venture down the dark descent and up to reascend, though hard and rare. Thee, again a reference to the light, I revisit safe and feel thy sovereign vital lamp. But thou revisits not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn. So thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs or dim suffusion veiled. Yet not the more cease I to wander where the muses haunt, clear spring or shady grove or sunny hill, smit with the love of sacred song. But chief thee, Zion, and the flowery brooks beneath that wash thy hallowed feet and warbling flow. Nightly I, I visit, nor sometimes forget, those other two equaled with me in fate. So were I equaled with them in renown, blind Thamyris and blind Maonides, Maonides is Homer, and Tiresias and Phineas, prophets old, all blind men. Then feed on thoughts that voluntary move, harmonious numbers as the wakeful bird sings darkling and in shadiest covert hid tunes her nocturnal note, the nightingale. Thus with the year, the year seasons return, but not to me returns day or the sweet approach of even or morn or sight of vernal bloom or summer's rose of, or flocks or herds or human face divine. But cloud instead in ever during dark surrounds me from the cheerful ways of men cut off and for the, for the book of knowledge fair, presented with a universal blank of nature's works, to me expunged and raised, and wisdom at one entrance quite shut out. So much the rather thou, celestial light, shine inward and the mind through all her powers irradiate. There plant eyes, all mist from thence purge and disperse that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sights is very appropriate and very helpful. I'm going to describe something that no man can see, but guess what? I can't see. And to see this vision, I don't need eyes. I need heavenly sight. I need the sight. I need a vision from God. And I don't need eyes for that. I'm going to, right? So he, he uses his own actual physical dark, uh, blindness to suggest the spiritual sight needed to describe what he's about to do. All this feeds into the uh, fame of John Milton as writer, not just the great poet, but the man gifted by God uniquely to tell uh, this epic account. That's how he regards himself, by the way. And you can see it in his uh, notebooks and jottings from when he was a teenager that he had thought he'd been called by God to compose this great Christian epic. And he writes it. Uh, at the end of his life, when he's defeated, along with Cromwell and the Cromwellian government under house arrest, a blind old man whose days are done. And now, even though he can't see, he is dictating the epic that he believes he had been ordained to write 40 years before. And it's an extraordinary story. It's biographically, it's extraordinary. Huge influence on, on those that fall. But he appeals to light. Now, light, of course, uh, Jesus is the light of the world. So it's not just a light and darkness thing. It's, it's, it's theological language. Light connotes the presence of God. It's one of the chief connotations of the presence of God. Although there's also the God uh, as, as, a, as a thick, dark presence as well. So if you think about the Exodus... By night, he's a fiery pillar. So you follow him, it's light in the dark. By day, this dark cloud, and they follow him during the day like that. So it's not only uh, light, but chiefly it is light. God is connoted with light. Uh, and uh, the light that illumines our path, the light 
Thy light is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, said the psalmist. So he's, he's laying hold of that in order to describe a bright heavenly place. Now remember, the description of hell was the exact opposite. It was dark. There was no light there, but rather darkness visible. And all these has, have theological implications. So if you're interested in this as a, as a topic, you could look at uh, C.S. Lewis's preface to Paradise Lost. I don't really want you to spend too much time reading secondary works, but this is quite helpful if you were uh, interested in the idea. And look at what he says on Augustine, because it's Augustinian theology here. God is good. He has being. Uh, there's no such thing as evil, per se. It's the absence of good. So darkness is the absence of light. It's not really anything, per se. And when we think of light and darkness as things that we see, those are in some ways metaphor for true darkness, which is a spiritual thing, and true light, which is a spiritual thing again, and not a physical. So the physical is a correspondent to the truly uh, real thing. Anyway, Augustine is helpful on that. If you want to have a look at it, I think it might be chapter 7, but I can't remember now. Got it up on my shelf. But that, that explains part of his depiction here of, uh, of, of hell as the n having no light but darkness visible, and again, the portrait of, of heaven here as well. But let's move on to uh, what he sees now and the theological language here. I'll pick it up with that. Because we left off with the discussion between Satan, sin, and death, and now, finally, we hear from God. Line 56, then. Now, had the Almighty Father from above, from the pure Empyrean where he sits, high throned above all height, bent down his eye, his own works, and their works at once to view. Sorry, let me find my page here. About him, all the sanctities of heaven stood thick as stars, and from his sight received beatitude past utterance. On his right, the radiant image of his glory sat. Notice the image. Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the image of God. The image of the invisible God. Uh, his only son. On earth, he first beheld our, first, our two first parents, yet the only two of mankind, in the happy garden placed, reaping immortal fruits of joy and love, uninterrupted joy, unrivaled love, in blissful solitude. He then surveyed hell and the gulf between, and Satan there, coasting the wall of heaven on this side, night, in the dun air sublime, and ready now to stoop with wearied wings and willing feet on the bare outside of this world that seemed firm land embosomed without firmament, uncertain which, in ocean or in air, because he's never encountered either. Is he landing on the water? Is he landing on the air? What, what's he, what is this firmament thing? Him beholding, him God beholding from his prospect high, wherein past, present, future he beholds, thus to his only son, foreseeing spake, only begotten son, seest thou what rage transports our adversary whom no bounds prescribed, no bars of hell, nor all the chains heaped on him there, nor yet the main abyss wide interrupt can hold, so bent he seems on desperate revenge that shall redound upon his own rebellious head? And now, through all restraint broke loose, he wings his way, not far off heaven in the precincts of light, directly towards the new created world, and man there placed, with purpose to assay if him by force he can destroy, or worse, by some false guile pervert, and shall pervert. For man will hearken to his glozing lies and easily transgress the sole command sole pledge of his obedience, so will fall he and his faithless progeny. Predicts everything that's going to happen. Satan will be successful. Whose fault? 
whose but his own? Mankind. Ingrate, he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Freely they stood who stood and fell who fell. Not free, what proof could they have given sincere of true allegiance? Constant faith or love where only what they needs must do appeared, not what they would. What praise could they receive? What pleasure I from such obedience paid when will and reason, reason also is choice, useless and vain, of freedom both despoiled, made passive both, had served necessity, not me. They, therefore, as to right belonged, so were created, nor can justly accuse their maker, or their making, or their fate, as if predestination overruled their will, disposed by absolute decree or high foreknowledge. They themselves decreed their own revolt, not I. If I foreknew foreknowledge, if I foreknew foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proved certain unforeknown. So without least impulse or shadow of fate or aught by me immutably foreseen, they trespass, authors to themselves in all, both what they judge and what they choose. For so I form them, free, and free they must remain till they enthrall themselves. I else must change their nature and revoke the high decree, unchangeable, eternal, which ordained their freedom. They themselves ordained their fall. The first sort, by their own suggestion, fell, self-tempted, self-depraved. Man falls deceived by the other first. Man, therefore, shall find grace, the other none. In mercy and justice both, through heaven and earth, so shall my glory excel. But mercy first and last shall brightest shine. So this is an interesting speech. Uh, it takes the place of only 50 odd lines, and yet he speaks the whole of, not quite the whole of human history, but describes a great deal here. He's not just describing the success of Satan perverting mankind, mankind's fall, but he's also predicting or telling that mankind will receive grace for his fall. And the reason for it is that he was deceived by Satan, and whereas Satan was undeceived. So therefore, Satan will not receive grace, explaining the different tr differential treatment there as well. Now, why did mankind sin? Well, because of deception, of course, but also because he had the capacity to sin. And that's because he was given freedom, because he bore the image of God. God is not compelled in his nature to do anything. He acts freely. Mankind bearing the Imago Dei, bearing the image of God, is likewise free to choose. And they are free to choose whether they're going to follow God or whether they're going to disobey. And there's a, a way of determining what that will be, and that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the only thing that they're not allowed to do, is to eat of that tree. Now, why is the tree there? To demonstrate they have a choice. I mean, if they can only choose good things and there's no capacity for disobedience, then there's no real choices. If all the choices are the exact same thing, there's no uh, distinction whatsoever, no moral distinction, because this is the component of choice that's most uh, important to Milton and his audience and scripture, is the moral choice to obey God or not. He has to have the, a real choice. Otherwise, uh, he is... Uh, it's not true allegiance, and, th and then he can't display true love, because love involves a choice. And God longs to be worshipped. When he say longs, he deserves worship. And Adam derives pleasure from worshipping. That's the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, what's question, what's the chief end of man? And, it's to glor and the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So there's something in our nature that when we glorify God, we, uh, we ourselves benefit from the, the glorification. 
because that's what we were made for. So the philosopher will describe human nature as um, a being with reason. So a rational animal is how they put it in the 18th century. Uh, taking that to some degree from Aristotle. Aristotle also said that mankind is a political animal. Lives in a polis, in a city. Has social relations, has a social aspect to his being. A and he notes the other animals don't do that. Right? They don't have a society. They don't have gradations and hierarchies and these sorts of things. It's not that they have no communal life, but they don't have a society as such. So these things, it's a rational animal, a political animal, yes, but, the, uh, but they're missing out the key component, which is that we are, um, uh, we're made for love. This is what the theologians will say. This is what Augustine says. The chief feature of mankind, of human nature, is that we, are, uh, we love things, and we are formed by what we love, furthermore. And we either love God, in which case we find our human fulfillment, or we love something else, in which we find our ruin, in which case we find our ruin. And it's not the love per se that's the problem, it's the object of the love. So if you love anything ahead of God, above God, then it's what the Bible calls idolatry. And idolatry has consequences for the person doing the, Id the idolizing. We saw it with Satan. He loved himself. What's the terrible consequence? It's just been portrayed for us. Whereas to love God is to give him his due reward, and it's also to give delight to the creature who is made to do precisely that. And Augustine, I mentioned Augustine in Preface to Paradise Lost, his whole theology is rooted in this idea of love. And uh, the proper allocation of love, which is towards God, like what's the greatest commandment Jesus was asked? Love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And there's a second that's like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. There is no commandment greater than these. Okay, so that, it, to know God is to love him. That's the heart of the Decalogue, even, is, is loving your neighbor and loving God above all. Um, and if you don't do that, then you love something else. And chiefly, you probably love yourself. Regard yourself as a divinity of sorts. Don't like to be contradicted on how you ought to behave there. But there's a ruin that happens in that, Mis misapplied love. But Augustine, if you look at his theology, it's all rooted in uh, the love of God. And uh, last semester we looked at how Dante, to some degree, uh, rooted his whole uh, divine comedy on the same principle. So in the uh, Inferno, there were different degrees and types of love that had been misapplied and you got placed in hell to a differing degree depending on what the object of your love was and the motivation for it. So there was a hierarchy. In, uh, in Dante's case, at least in the Inferno, it was based on Aristotle's ethics. But that's a complexity, we'll just leave that out here. But it's, it's love. And so they had to choose to love God for God's sake. And they had to have an alternative to demonstrate that they did choose him for his sake. And it had to be a worthy alternative, something that seemed good. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that seems like a pretty good thing to have. Because isn't that a godlike thing, to have the knowledge of good and evil? Those are godlike attributes. So it has to be, there's, a, there's something about it. And the reason why you don't do it is simply because God said, don't do it. No other reason. So it's simply to obey. And that will demonstrate whether you love God. Not because it makes sense to you, not because uh, there's a benefit that you perceive in it, but simply you do it because God told you to do it and you love God and you are going to do that for that reason, for, that, for the reason of loving him. Now that's where Satan is going to creep in and he's going to come between uh, Adam and Eve and God and he's going to twist their thinking on this. 
and that will bring about the fall. But there's all this discussion here of freedom and predestination because, of course, God predestines everything because he's God, right? Doctrine of predestination is not a, a uh, Protestant doctrine. It's there in Thomas Aquinas just as much. A God who doesn't predestine everything is not God. Not only does he know what's going to happen, it all happens in accordance with his will. If it didn't, then God would not be all powerful. Everything happens in accordance with his good and perfect will. Right? So that he's talking about that. And, but there's an appearing, apparent conflict there, right? If choice, then how, is, how are those things possible? And note in the portrait also, it, it, even at the outset there, he describes Satan coming out of hell, and he says that nothing could have stopped him. But we were, Milton himself told us back in uh, book two, or it was book one, that he could not have lifted his head off the, the fiery lake if he had not been given permission from God. So there's a little bit of a contradiction there in the account at any rate. I think Milton is describing, again, something that uh, is to some degree irreconcilable, and he's happy with that. He's affirming two truths. It's a paradox there. Now, this is the condition of Adam and Eve. They are free. They're, and note that they were sufficient to have stood, though free to fall is a famous line. They were sufficient to have stood. It's not that they had to fall. If they weren't sufficient to stand, then they can't really be judged for falling. So they have to have the ability to withstand the temptation. And yet they have the freedom to err because otherwise they wouldn't be sufficient to loving. So both of those things he's affirming here. Now once they fall, so here's the question and you get into all this stuff with, uh, in, a, in a place like Tyndale where they, you, know, you get the Calvinists and the Arminians and the free will and the predestination, all this sort of discussion here. Milton seems to be coming down on both sides, if you will. I think he's, I think he's asserting the Calvinist position myself, but some, you, you rarely hear it as well put as it is here. What is being, what's different between Adam and Eve's situation and our situation is that after the fall, we are no longer free. We, uh, everyone in the room here, Adam and Eve had the free choice to obey or to disobey. After original sin, we are all marked by sin. So he says, so falls he and all his faithless progeny. He's not He's not uh, accusing the progeny of doing anything there. It's just that they will also lack faith just like Adam did. They will inherit the faithlessness that comes from being Adam's great, 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 great grandchildren, whatever, number of greats. So it's an inherited sinful nature. And that means that they are no longer free to love God. They are bound by sin. They're created, they're born in sin and then sin to their mothers conceive them, right? And so they have the problem. What can a sinful person who loves himself and is, is wedded to sin, as it were, and is devoted to death, what can that person do to come to faith in Christ? And the answer is absolutely nothing, because a dead person can't rise up. And we are dead in our sins. Jesus says it. So how on earth, then, does a person respond to the call of God? Who's going to make the call, the answer for him? Not the person, because the person's dead. Dead people can't do anything. It's the Holy Spirit that brings about the uh, regeneration of the person first. So regeneration precedes conversion. So when God calls, the dead sinner, the se dead sinner, just like the, the dead child, rises up from the dead state of spiritual state of sinful death and responds by the spirit implant. So it's a work of God. Conversion is a work of God. It's not a choice to follow Jesus, or at least not primarily. It's not the first edge. It's, a, it's obviously we experience the choice, but the choice is motivated by an action that doesn't come from us. It comes from outside, it comes from God. And then we choose, of course. We experience it as a choice. Yes, of course, I follow Jesus. But it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit within you. So it's a work of... Now, this is of huge personal, personal benefit to know this. Because it means if you have chosen to follow God, that was God working in you. And he who began a good work in you will finish it. 
right? So it's all God's. Now, this is what he's describing. He's not describing that here. I'm explaining it to you that it's, it's different. Don't confuse the state of Adam and Eve with our state. This isn't an evangelistic treatise on Milton's part here. He's just describing the original state of things. After that, it will be God who will have to rescue uh, Adam and Eve. And he announces that at the very end there. Man, therefore, shall find grace. Line 131. God pronounces that he will forgive the unforgivable. Right at the outset, right away. It's not plan B. If you think about God, in, in a sense, everything's happened in accordance with God's purposes. It was always plan A. Did God bring about the fall? No, Adam brought about the fall, but did God realize that the fall was going to happen? and know and plan around it and be willing to forget. Yes, all of these things are being asserted. They sound uh, contradictory, and to some degree they are. By human reckoning, they must be. Because not, there's a, not a reciprocity. What does, what does the sinner do, do to deserve grace? Nothing. There's no merit in it. That's the point. It's a work of God. So he pronounces this at the outside, and the, having pronounced it, this is God the Father. This is not Jesus. This is the father pronouncing that mankind will find grace and the other none. And in both cases, in mercy and justice, both through heaven and earth, so shall my glory excel. But mercy first and last shall brightest shine. So we talked about the light at the outset in the kingdom of God, but here's the brightest form of light. It's the light of mercy that reflects the character of God. And thus, while God spake, back to the text, 135, ambrosial fragrance filled all heaven and in the blessed spirits elect sense of new joy ineffable diffused beyond compare the son of god was seen most glorious in him all his father shone substantially expressed and in his face divine compassion visibly appeared love without end and without measure grace while uttering thus he to his father spake O oh, father Gracious was that word which closed thy sovereign sentence, that man should find grace, for which both heaven and earth shall high extol thy praises with the innumerable sound of hymns and sacred songs wherewith thy throne and compass shall resound thee ever blessed. For should man finally be lost? He's entertaining it as a theological. This is where people find it troubling. It sounds like they're entertaining a theological university dispute. Like, what would happen if? What if? Well, he knows what's going to happen, but what, let's just imagine for a minute. What if man would be lost? Should man, thy creature, late so loved, thy youngest son, fall circumvented th thus by fraud, though joined with his own folly, that be from thee far? That far be from thee, Father, who art judge of all things made and judgest only right. Or shall the adversary thus obtain his end and frustrate thine? Shall he fulfill his malice and thy goodness bring to naught or proud return, which to his heavier doom yet with revenge accomplished, and to hell draw after him the whole race of, he, of mankind by him corrupted? Or wilt thou thyself abolish thy creation and unmake for him what for thy glory thou hast made? So should thy goodness and thy greatness both be questioned and blasphemed without defense. So this is the point here. And note that the son is most zealous to preserve the father's integrity and his reputation. What if mankind was allowed to go where he deserves to go? Then Satan would win. And you would not be all powerful. And people would not call you good. They might question your goodness. Had you not declared from the outset that you would show grace to mankind. But you are in the driver's seat all along here. In spite of this, you're going to overrule it because grace is not a, a just response to the transgression. It's an unmerited one. It's not controlled by Satan. Satan's not in the driver's seat here. Grace is not dependent on sin. 
It's not dependent. It's related, but it's not dependent on it. Satan is not driving the agenda here. God is. You've got to understand that. And to whom the great creator thus replied, O son, in whom my soul hath chief delight, son of my bosom, son who art alone my word, my wisdom and effectual might, all thou hast spoken are as my thoughts are, all as my eternal purpose hath decreed. Man shall not quite be lost, but saved who will, yet not of will in him, but grace in me freely vouchsafed. Once more I will renew his lapsed powers, though forfeit and enthralled by sin, to foul exorbitant desires. Upheld by me, yet once more he shall stand on even ground against his mortal foe. By me upheld, that he may know how frail his fallen condition is, and to me owe all his deliverance, and to none but me. Again, he's explaining the, the breadth of what grace entails for human life after the fall. We owe everything to God, upheld by his grace, saved by his grace, brought to life by his grace. And he will stand again as we stand. If we've placed our faith in Christ, now we have an enemy and we are upheld by the power of God. Okay. Some I have chosen of peculiar grace, elect above the rest, so is my will. The rest shall hear me, call and oft be warned their sinful state, and to appease betimes the insensate deity while offered grace invites, for I will clear their senses dark what may suffice and soften stony hearts to pray, repent, and bring obedience due. To prayer, repentance, and obedience due, though but endeavored with sincere intent, mine ear shall not be slow, mine eyes not shut, and I will place within them as a guide my umpire conscience, whom if they will hear, light after light well used, they shall attain, and to the end persisting safe arrive. This my long sufferance and my day of grace, they who neglect and scorn shall never taste, but hard be hardened, blind be blinded more, that they may stumble on and deeper fall, and none but such from mercy I exclude. Yet all is not done. Man, disobeying, disloyal, breaks his fealty and sins. How about this? God's pronounced that there will be grace, but there's still, how about justice? How about justice? This is man dis obeying disloyal breaks his feeling. God must be just. He cannot just leave it at grace. We're going to ignore it. Why can't God just forgive us our sins and not do anything about it? Because there would be injustice in the world. God is just, won't allow it. Man disloyal breaks his fealty and sins against the high supremacy of heaven, affecting Godheads, pretending to be like gods. And so, losing all to expatiate his treason, hath not left but to destruction, sacred and devote, he with his whole posterity must die. So God's pronounced grace, and now he's pronounced that mankind must die, because there's nothing that can save him. So what's going to happen here? Now it's being presented as a hypothetical. He knows the answer, by the way. These are rhetorical questions that he's asking. Die he or justice must, unless for him some other able and as willing pay the rigid satisfaction, death for death. So first of all, two conditions. He has to be able to pay for man's sin, and he has to be willing. And when you say willing, he has to be free. Who is free to pay for his sin? Not man. Man is fallen. He's no longer free has to be able, who could do such a thing to overcome sin and death. Say, heavenly powers, where shall we find such love? Which of ye will be mortal, that is subject to death, to redeem man's mortal crime and just, the unjust to save, dwells in all heaven charity so dear? He asked. But all the heavenly choir stood mute, and silence was in heaven. Just like when Satan said, you know, here's the plan. We're going to go out and pervert mankind. You know, who's going to do this now? And there's silence in hell. And then Satan comes forward. It's his grand moment. Same parallel happening here. So we're meant to compare and contrast the two. And there are, there are distinct differences between the two accounts as well, but there are certainly parallels. 
but it says he stood and silence was in heaven on man's behalf, patron or intercessor, none appeared, much less that durst upon his own head draw the deadly forfeiture and ransom set. Ransom set by who? Who sets the ransom? The devil? Sin? God. God is going to punish the one who intercedes on mankind's behalf. The Father will punish the one who stands in his way. In other words, the Father will uh, pour our sins on the Son's head and will pour out his wrath for it. That's Milton's understanding here. You hear things differently in churches here sometimes. This is malicious and wicked lies. This is, this is the gospel here. He says, And on man's behalf, patron and intercessor, none appeared, much less that durst upon his own head draw the deadly forfeiture and ransom set. And now without redemption, all mankind must have been lost, a judge to death and hell by doom severe, had not the Son of God, in whom the fullness dwells of love divine, his dearest mediation thus renewed. Father, thy word is past. Man shall find grace. And shall grace not find means that finds her way, the speediest of thy winged messengers to visit all thy creatures, and to all comes unprevented, unimplored, unsought. Happy for man so coming. He, her aid, can never seek once dead in sins and lost. Atonement for himself or offering meat, indebted and undone, hath none to bring. Behold me then, me for him, life for life I offer. On me let thine anger fall. Account me man. I, for his sake, will leave thy bosom and this glory next to thee, freely put off and for him, lastly, die well pleased. On me let death wreck all his rage. Under his gloomy power I shall not long lie vanquished. Thou hast given me to possess life in myself forever. By thee I live, though now to death I yield and am his due. All that of me can die, yet that debt paid, thou wilt not leave me in the loathsome grave, his prey, nor suffer my unspotted soul forever with corruption there to dwell. But I shall rise victorious and subdue my vanquisher, spoiled of his vaunted spoil. Death, his death's wound shall then receive and stoop inglorious of his mortal sting disarmed. I, through the ample air and triumph high, shall lead hell captive, maugre hell, and show the powers of darkness bound. Thou at the sight pleased out of heaven shall look down and smile while by thee raised I ruin all my foes, death last, and with his carcass glut the grave. Then with the multitude of my redeemed shall enter heaven so long absent and return, Father, to see thy face, wherein no cloud of anger shall remain, but peace assured and reconcilement, wrath shall be no more. Thenceforth, but in thy presence, joy entire. Substitutionary atonement, right there. God will substitute himself in our place and bear the wrath of the Father. And with him will lead many who have faith in him. Uh, by his power, he will bring them with him and he will destroy sin and death. And all of the vestiges of sin. That, uh, there, and his words here ended. I, I won't even add much to it. It's just so glorious. So wonderfully put. I, I, I said I question whether Milton, Milton could pull off what he's pulling off. And I think to some degree he can't for the reasons I suggested. I, I meant that genuinely. But having said that, I can't imagine it better put than he put it. I just don't think he can possibly succeed because, he's, again, he's giving language. But this is, I think it's, it's glorious. And again, it's a free choice of his part. It's a just act. It's a gracious act. It explains 
the whole of Paradise Lost here. Now his words ended, but his meek aspect, his meek face, silent yet spake, and breathed immortal love to mortal men, above which only shone filial obedience, obedience of the Son to the Father. As a sacrifice, glad to be offered, he attends the will of his great Father. Admiration seized all heaven. What this might mean and whither tend. Wondering, but soon the Almighty thus replied, O thou in heaven and earth, the only peace found out for mankind under wrath, O thou my soul complacence. Right? When the Father, when the Son is baptized in the Jordan, he rises up and said, Behold my Son, in whom I am well pleased, my soul complacence. Well thou knowest how dear to me are all my works, nor man the least, though last created, that for him I spare thee from my bosom and right hand to save. By losing thee a while, the whole race lost. Thou therefore whom thou only canst redeem, their nature also to thy nature join. And be thyself man among men on earth, made flesh, when time shall be a virgin seed by wondrous birth. Now this is the mediation of the Father. The mediator, there's a, there's a strike on right now in Ontario in which the teachers are on strike and the go government's on one side and the unions are on the other and it, they can't reconcile themselves. Now eventually they may bring in a mediator. When a mediator comes in, in that understanding, the mediator is not part of the government and it's not a member of the union. It's a, it's a third party. When God does his mediation, he belongs to both parties. This is the problem with the word mediation here is we tend to confuse it. He is both God and man. He is on both sides because he has to have a human nature in order to bear the, the uh, punishment, the just punishment for sin, but he has to be God in order to do the reconciling, to have the power to do it. So he is the, he is the mediator, he is both God and man. Sent by the Father, the Son goes and becomes incarnate, takes on human flesh, the light of the world. Anyway, um, that's the center of Paradise Lost. Now that is left out of every anthology as well. I've never seen an anthology that put book three of Paradise Lost in it. And I don't know how you can read Paradise Lost without it. But anyway, that's why we've read it. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, I can't remember if we go on to book four next time or if we go on to book nine, but have a look at it. Uh, I think I had some readings from book four and if it's both, if it's moving on to nine, I'll try and do a little bit of four because I want to have a look at human nature. We haven't gone there yet. We're in hell, we're in heaven. How about Adam and Eve? How are they portrayed? I, I want to look at that first before the temptation scene. Okay, and I'll see you next time.